Welcome, uh, everybody, um, to uh, this uh, second uh, event uh, in our um, series um, on uh, Islam and liberalism, with altogether uh, 10 uh, events. Um, our starting event uh, last month was with uh, Ahmed Kourou on uh, democracy uh, in the Muslim world. Um, the uh, registration, the video registration of that event is meanwhile also uh, online uh, for those of you who are interested and the same will also be uh, the case um, a couple of days or maybe a week after this event uh, uh, today. Um, I also want to already point uh, you towards our next uh, event which will be on uh, the 20th of April uh, about women's rights uh, and Islam uh, where our uh, principal speaker is uh, the Iranian-born civil rights activist Mariam Namazia. So um, I very much invite you to be uh, present there as well. Uh, then regarding uh, today's event, um, uh, unlike uh, what was uh, advertised, I regret to inform you uh, that one of our speakers, uh, Ludovic Mohamed Saed, um, will not uh, be here uh, today. He uh, actually cancelled his participation um, uh, in the last moment, a couple of days ago. Um, and it's not entirely clear why uh, he cancelled, uh, not for personal reasons. Um, the reason why he cited that I don't want to uh, sort of um, hide this because I think there's, it's relevant to the topic that we're debating, you know, LGBT rights and Islam, women's rights and Islam as well, but I think there's probably no other topic uh, in relation to Islam that is so sensitive uh, as uh, LGBT uh, rights. Um, and uh, one of the consequences uh, of this fact is this, that, that many people who are working in this field actually have to deal with serious uh, security uh, issues. I mean, Tugai can uh, tell us about that maybe later on also. And this is also true, and that's something one should certainly uh, appreciate. Uh, that's also the case for uh, Ludovic Mohamed Sahed, who is uh, an openly gay uh, imam uh, in France. Um, and, you know, um, taking such a position uh, on this issue um, within uh, Muslim communities is not easy. Um, so, having said that, um, um, although um, uh, Ludovic Mohamed Sahed was informed uh, about the composition of the panel already uh, at the beginning of March, all of a sudden, um, um, he announced that he was not willing to be part of this event if Tugay Saraj would be uh, the moderator. Um, and um, as an explanation, he referred to the fact that after this had been uh, announced um, uh, via Twitter, he got a lot of negative reactions. He referred in a very vague way to security issues, but when asked to be more specific about what these issues then were, he remained silent and refused to become more specific, which I think if there were really security issues is quite inappropriate, because if, these, uh, if there are security issues related to Tukai's presence, then that's uh, something that concerns Tukai, and it uh, actually concerns all of us, and especially concerns us as the organizers. We don't know what exactly happened, but I think the fact that Ludwig Mohamed Said, for whatever reason, uh, is not here today, is indicative of the difficulty uh, of having the debate uh, on the topic that we're uh, debating today. And that's, that's all I want to say about it. Uh, and I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. Um, you know, one should appreciate that everybody who is active in this field uh, has to deal with these security issues. And that also goes for Ludovic Mohamed Sahed, and that might, might explain part of his uh, behavior. So, um, yeah. Um, Tommaso Virgili uh, will moderate uh, this debate uh, and he will also introduce our two uh, speakers, uh, Araj Gitu and um, 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 Tugay Saraj. So let me just say a little bit about uh, Tommaso. Um, Tommaso is a senior researcher here uh, at the Weitz at Bay in the Department of Migration, Integration, Transnationalization. He is a lawyer by training. Um, 
a legal scholar, and he specializes on minority rights, both uh, in um, countries of the Muslim world as well as in Muslim communities in Europe. And he is the author uh, of the book Islam, Constitutional Law and Human Rights, Sexual Minorities and Free Thinkers in Egypt and Tunisia, which appeared with Routledge in 2021. So with this, I pass the floor to Tommaso. We will introduce the two other speakers. So thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you very much. I'm very happy, despite the sudden change in the program, Sorry for you that you have got me instead of another more relevant speaker, but still I'm very happy to be here to introduce this, uh, this talk, which I believe is extremely important and topical. For the reason that Ruth was saying that the topic of LGBT rights and Islam is perhaps one of the most problematic. And this emerges from the Muslim world. Most Muslim countries criminalize same-sex behaviors up to the death penalty. The 11 countries that criminalize homosexuality with the capital punishment are Muslim countries that do so uh, citing Sharia law, but also in our Muslim communities in Europe. Several studies show that um, within Muslim communities, LGBT people are subjected to a level of homophobia and sometimes active persecution, which is higher than among other communities. However, let me also say that the purpose of this event series is to show that this doesn't exhaust the picture of Islam and especially doesn't exhaust the picture of people coming from a Muslim background. There is no one Islam, there is no one prototypical Muslims, and that's why I'm very happy and proud to have these two gentlemen close to me uh, today to, to show that another way is possible, that there are people brave enough to challenge, no matter how big the majority is, to challenge the rhetoric of uh, the majority within the Islamic, the Muslim milieu. So on my left, I have Tugay Serac, uh, as Ruth says, said, is a lecturer at the progressive Ibi Rushkete Mosque in Berlin. And this personal story, allow me to say a couple of words of it because it's extremely relevant for the purposes of this talk. He self-radicalized himself a few years ago because he struggled to reconcile his homosexuality with his faith. And actually now he's running a program at the mosque for ex-Muslims and LGBT Muslims, a program of lectures, roundtables, even marriages. And he's also addressing uh, youngsters in schools to present a liberal interpretation of Islam when it comes to women's rights and gay rights. And on my right, I have Arash Gito. Arash Gito is a research associate at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative and International Private Law in Hamburg. I didn't mention that Tugay is of Turkish origin. Arash is Iranian, but he has been living in exile in Germany for a few years. And he received his PhD in Islamic Studies and Cultural Anthropology in Kiel with a dissertation on the history of male same-sex desire in Iran, out of which he published several articles and a book. Now, uh, each of the speakers will have about 15, 17 minutes for their initial presentation, and then there will be time for uh, a discussion with the audience. Ruth mentioned that the, uh, this talk is going to be uploaded, but if any of you is concerned with privacy, only the podium will be uh, screened in the video. So uh, when I will invite questions from you, I leave it to you to decide whether you want to introduce yourself or just to, uh, to state your interest or maybe previous knowledge about the, uh, the matter. So uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to our first speaker, Arash, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Well, yeah, nice. 
thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for organizing this uh, indeed very important uh, issue, uh, this discussion on this very important issue. As Tommaso mentioned, I am, I feel like ir exile Iranian, and you might know, of course you know, that there has been a new struggle for freedom in, in uh, my country. And uh, there have been a lot of lives, young lives lost because just uh, they uh, were trying to, to, to achieve a life, which, what they call normal life, um, a life in freedom, an individual fri free, free life. Therefore, I wish a silent minute uh, in remembrance of people who we lost uh, in the last uh, the months in Iran. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. So let me start my discussion. I hope that I managed to keep my time. I my ask day. you to remember, remind me, uh, but I have uh, written a few points on this issue related to my own um, research. I myself don't understand myself as a Muslim, you know, I'm cultural Muslim, let's say. I was born in a Muslim country, as you may know, you may know, you may know the most of people, they have to, you know, register themselves as, as you know, uh, in this, this religious communities or as a religious person, but, but I myself, I'm atheist, therefore I wanted to make it clear uh, that I'm not just sharing some, you know, inside perspectives from a Muslim community. So I start my discussion with a critical remark on the title of the event, uh, not criticizing you and the, the uh, organizer of this event, but this, this question is somehow the way it has been asked and it is still asked in the Western or, or European countries, are LGBT rights and Islam compatible or is something inherent, inherently, inherently uh, uh, is special about Islam uh, that um, just hinder uh, this um, harmony between um, homosexuality and um, being Muslim. What is troubling for me is for this uh, part of this title, Inherent Oxymoron, uh, troubling is the assumption that I at least I understand under this, this, this uh, um, term, inherent oxymoron, that there is some kind of unchangeable truth about uh, religion. You know, we have, you have your LGBT rights and Islam, inherent oxymoron or possible harmony. You know, for, from a perspective of a person who consider religion as a social uh, uh, construct, I don't believe in anything which um, could be considered as an essential core of something. And there are enough, um, there are enough historical um, examples uh, to see that religions are changing, you know. There is nothing 
like a core of religion. This is a very essentialist way to see the religion. If uh, we ask, is Islam um, compatible with homosexuality or is, could Islam be tolerant uh, towards homosexuality or not? Uh, you know, we are assuming that there is something like a central core to Islam, and there is not, not such a thing in the religions. You know, if you just look at the history about the religions which are now today known as the religions of peace, not only Christianity, if you just look over uh, Buddhism, you know, you, have, you find a lot of Buddhism, uh, uh, Buddhist violence entities, uh, you know, in Japan or, or in many, many places. And um, uh, can you ask this question? Can you really ask this question about Christianity? Is Christianity inherently something different from, from other religions that this one is uh, an exception, accepting, an, as, ac accepting um, homosexuality or uh, sexual di diversity? Is it something special about Christianity? I would say no. The Christians, they were, they were pushed, they had to adopt this individualist, liberalist discourse. You know, the freedom of, uh, none, none of the Western freedoms, they came from, 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 uh, from the religion. The religion was the last, the last stance that started to accept it somehow. Freedom of women, you know, any, any kind of individual freedom that you imagine, which are in, in contrast with, with a collective sense of religion. You know, they were challenging to the, to the Christianity. It was not the church who opened itself uh, to, to, to uh, LGBT and then the, the Christians. Says, yes, our, our religion is so uh, tolerant. No, they were, they were under pressure because of the growth of, of uh, this individualist, liberalist discourse in Europe, in, in the Western societies. You know, the, the, the same thing can happen to Islam. That's my point. You know, if you have a society who is pressuring the, the religious authority, we will not accept you if you don't, you know, uh, adopt our discourse. They are gone. You know, just look what's happening to the Catholic Church. You know, it's step by step. And uh, therefore, I don't believe that, that it has, I, I'm, you know, I'm convinced that it's nothing special about the religion here or the religion there, which is, uh, which is more, uh, making a society more or less homophobic or more tolerant, and, but other discourses that, that they are putting this religious discourse on, under pressure. And uh, when it comes to the Muslim societies, let's say, I claim that in those societies or the, also the diaspora Muslim societies, that in those societies the local traditional structures and actors have managed and have been more successful to keep the dominance of, of these traditional religious narratives in confrontation with the modernity, with the liberal individual, individualist discourse, what I call here. Uh, especially from 1960s, you know, in the first, perhaps in the first uh, years of confrontation with modernity, let's say end of the um, 20th century and, and the first half of the end of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, you have a s somehow more or less powerful liberal discourse. In, you know, you have, you have intellectuals, you know, they, you, have, you have people who are managing the society. If you, I, I, I remain by my, my, my own uh, research region, Iran. If you look at the people who are policy makers in Iran, they are modernists. They have more or less an understanding that they want to modernize in the sense that, that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, secularization. Uh, they were more you know, uh, positive toward it. But from 1960s, I would say it's another issue. Perhaps I'm not even the expert to talk about this issue. We have a backlash, you know, some kind of, uh, let's say, Islamic revivalism. Uh, and uh, the consequences, you know, there are the events in the 1970s and the peak of them, let's say, it's the revolution in Iran, uh, which uh, um, a new entity uh, claiming to, to um, trying to, to um, just uh, manage the society 
through religion and to, um, uh, to, to provide a religious life for the societies. You know, after, um, from now on, from this time, um, the liberal secular discourse, not only in Iran, but also in other, in other Muslim countries, the actors and the forces have been highly under pressure, prosecution, death, you know, uh, you know, assassinations, you know, terror acts that uh, are not prosecuted by the states. And, um, you know, there is not much possibility in many Muslim countries to, to, to promote a liberal, secular version of, of existence, even of the religion, be it, uh, you know, something like atheist version. You know, you, you cannot imagine, you couldn't perhaps not imagine 20 years ago to, to be loudly atheist in Iran. You know, it would be really dangerous. Um, but what has happened? Uh, what is this Islamic revivalism? Um, one of the explanations which we read a lot and hear a lot in scholarly texts and in the conferences, that this new emerged political, political force uh, with Islam as identity I don't call it Isla Islamist, I, I, but I don't want to start this discussion why, don't, why I don't use the word Islamists. Uh, this Islamists, the idea is, you know, the, mo the main uh, claim in the science, in the, in the scholarly text, is that these Islamists are reinventing Islam through an, a new epistemological modern lens. That, uh, that means that... that uh, Khomeini or, or any other modern, you know, uh, temporary Islamists that you know, they are more or less modern thinking in their, their way of thinking, and they are reinterpreting uh, their um, religion in a modern way. Whereas the traditional world has been uh, much more tolerant, much more pluralist, pluralistic, you know, and uh, that is the explanation that you can find, like, in some works that have been highly read in, in scholarly crisis, uh, in, in scholarly circles, and as well as in the public, like, Kultur der Ambiguität, the culture of ambiguity from, from Thomas Bauer, in which he said that the imperialism is the moment that this pluralism is uh, lost. So, so to say. Um, let me come to, to the subject of the discussion and make this point perhaps more clear what I meant. You know, in the text on explanation for the poor situation of LGBT people in Muslim societies, you often read that the loss of tolerance towards non-heterosexual identities or acts is a result of, result of overtaking the imperialist Western modern ontology or epistemology. It means that the, let's say, Muslim some communities have, after um, after confront after the confrontation with the Western imperialist, more powerful um, Europeans, uh, mainly, they have started to think like them. I, I break it like now, uh, and there is nothing more than more, more left from tradition. Let's say traditional world. From now on, that's some people like Bauer would say, and many others, from now on we have Islamists and, and we have, uh, we have uh, modernists. Either the people are you know, enthusiastic about the idea of modernity in the Islamic world, or, uh, um, or they are not so, so much enthusiastic and are referring and reinventing uh, their own religion to, 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 uh, to keep something resistance against these changes. Um, well, um, the, uh, this would suggest, and you read such things like, from now on, the, the Muslim societies have started to prosecute LGBT people. And before that, it was very nice. You know, it was very tolerant, it was very pluralistic, and uh, everything that's oppressive is oppressive, everything that's, uh, that's you know, um, repressing the LGBT community, something like learns from the West. Against this idea, you can bring a lot of arguments. It is really astonishing that such an argument can, can remain 
uh, you know, in, in the scholarly discussions, although, you know, the first question you have to ask, did the modern Islamists invent uh, criminalization of reward in a same-sex act or, or zina? Who did that? You know, it's a classical Islamic law. You know, it's almost consensual. You know, I don't know any scholar, be it cheap or, or Sunni, that really seriously says it's, it's accepted. You know, if you look at the traditional scholarship, Islamic scholarship of jurists, yes, it uh, is clear that this, um, that this um, phenomena, this prosecution is nothing new. They didn't prosecute, but they have, it has one another reason, perhaps we discuss it, you know, uh, later, perhaps we could, we talked a little about it uh, before. Um, how much time do I have? Five. Five minutes, okay. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. So, uh, let's go back, let's go further. Yes, this the, the, the pairs point, you know, this, 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 this structures, they have been, um, they are before modernity. Um, but the, the, the other problem of this, this assumption that the, the, the pre-modern has been tolerant, uh, a very tolerant, pluralistic world regarding sexualities and sexual identities is, is that they, um, 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 they, they have just a few phenomena which are not heterosexual uh, relationship between old men, or elder guys and younger, you know, peder you know pederasty, something else this kind of relationships between uh, young men and old men. This is the only same-sex practice that you can find in the pre-modern Muslim world, just like many other pre-modern societies. It is itself another discussion how this phenomenon uh, exists. You know, the same-sex uh, relation between older guys you have under samurais, you have, uh, uh, you have in, in, in Florence. You know, you have a lot of societies in which there is a relation between young men who are at the same time the pupils of the guys and at the same time, you know. But seeing this phenomenon, that doesn't mean they have been tolerant against, uh, towards sexu sexu sexuality, a concept that they would never have known anything about, you know. It didn't exist the idea of sexuality as something inside people that we should respect. They, okay, I'm... Okay. So, um... um so, uh, t today's Afghanistan society has the same phenomenon. You know, this uh, young man dancing for old guys. We can discuss why, what is that? Is today's Afghanistan society a tolerant society? No. Uh, let's, let's do it fast. So, the most, the most critical thing that I have, to, I have to say, you know, this is the assumption that the Western people are coming they are there, and the non-Western societies, they say, now we have the truth for us. It's not a religion. They don't accept it. You know, you offer your, your, your explanation for the world. Of course, it is, it is very, very convincing for yourself, but not for the others. You know, the assumption that the, that the actors of the um, Middle Eastern societies or the Muslim societies they, confront, they were confronted with, with, with the uh, modern ideas of sexuality and they said, yes, we will, we will overtake it and we will get homophobic. How did it happen? There is no evidence for this claim. You know, if, you, if you look at the history of uh, dealing with same-sex issues, which I, which I did, it's always the contrary. I come to my point to say, until 1990s, you know, you have these traditional patterns of, of, of sexuality which are based on this patriarchal order, and it's not only the religion, but the religion is offering the normative, uh, the, it's the, the religion is offering the, uh, the providing the normative framework and mor uh, uh, moral boundaries, which is uh, uh, keeping these traditional structures upright. You know, it's playing a role, but not because it's inherently something, uh, something uh, against sexuality, but because the the, the, those with authority over religion, let's say jurists, traditional scholars, schools, and so on and so on, knowing about the potential loss of, of their power in the case of the rise 
of a more, more liberal individualist narrative, be it the religious one like yours, or be it a secular one or, or an atheist one, they, they know about this loss and have been actively defending these authorities, uh, their domain, always with, with the assistance of the, uh, the, the existing military power. I'm all stuck. Existing military power. I think that's the, the idea of Mr. Kuro, that, that Ahmed Kuro, that this is, this is cooperation between the religious caste, the traditional religious caste, and, and the military power. The best, by, the best example is Iran today. Um, and that's the point I'm trying to make. It's let's reduce Islamification of this discussion as if, if we come to the point and say, okay, Islam is, let's assume, is Islam is compatible to uh, homosexuality or vice versa, uh, you still have another structure, another traditionalist structures, the patriarchal structures, you have, you know, that, that, that they are still um, in charge in these societies. And just one last word to Iran. And the thing that you might, you might, you might ask yourself, what has happened in the last 40 years in the last year that something new is happening in Iran or outside Iran, the mobilization of I exiled Iran Iranians. What's happening? You know, we have always have protests in Iran. What's the difference between this time? If, if, you, if you talk to most Iranians, they would say it's different this time. And that's the point, because they people, it's a backlash. It's a very powerful backlash of a movement which, which is demanding a worthy secular life without religion and rejecting religion. You know, it's a very new phenomenon in, in, in the Iranian society. In this scale, you see, you, you see um, symbols of religion falling that you cannot even imagine, you couldn't even imagine 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. So um, that's... Um, that's the point of hope, and I prefer to, to end up my words with this point of hope. I am very uh, positive and a very uh, um, uh, that that in the future, this comeback of of, of this non-religious or or this modern way of thinking uh, would I speculate with its comeback. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Arash. Um, maybe let me just follow up with a quick question on where you left. So, despite the fact that I think we are all hopeful for a more liberal Iran, your own research that focuses on a homo focused on a homoerotic blog in Iran showed that the traditional understanding of sexuality prevails even among. Uh, the, the, those who um, or consume uh, a homoerotic blog. So what makes you think that in this current situation the overall Iranian people, despite being against the regime, would nevertheless be in favor of LGBT rights? Uh, it's a very, very good question. Of course, in my, you, as you said, um, one of the things that I uh, research on is the self-identity, is the subjectivity of people having se same-sex se uh, activities. And um, I try to show that there are many men having sex with men and don't consider themselves in the modern say, sense as homosexual, not because they don't like to be another case, but the concept of sexuality, that's something inherent that we cannot control, that's something psychological, it's somehow not present there. You know, there are ideas there that, that sex itself could, you know, sex, just an experience, experiencing, for example, same-sex uh, uh, activities and it's a very traditional anthropology. It's a very old anthropology. It it's go, goes back to, to, to Aristotle and they, they, and if you if you have I mean, everyone has pleasure in same sex safe, sex as it's the idea of many of the the jurists. You know everyone has pleasure in it. You have to go. You don't have to go toward it. You get addicted to it. It's so good. You know they say it's good. You know, and um, uh, to come back there, yes, of course, um, many people in the society also, you know, adhere to this to this uh, 
idea of sexual being. But but I believe that uh, you know just just looking at the discourse now, you know, looking what the statements, what what the small cities, you know, looking at many things that are happening in Iran, um, and looking at the you know fact that LGBT issues are in discussion. You know, they are, they are mentioned, you know, they are in the papers, they are mentioned, you know, the rainbow family, we say, the Rangin Kamoni, uh, you know, they are, they are a part of this discussion. There's the question about... Even the public discussion. Even, even the public, you know, let's say, let's say the, the social media discussion, you know, there are, of course, homophobic, you know, uh, uh, still there are co comments on this, but uh, generally uh, being a part of, you know, because it's the, the like alliance between women and, and LGBT hmm. is there. You know, this this kind of alliance you can find it in other countries too, you know, I guess. Uh, and there's something like if freedom, then for everyone. Everyone. That's the, that's the idea of that's woman life freedom. An important novelty. Thank you very much. And now let me go to Tugai. Please, you also have you also have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the Really interesting input. Um, definitely, I would um, agree that it is also an issue of patriarchy, not not only religion, but there's, of course, there's a basis in religion, but it is lots of issues are about patriarchy and religious authorities that are scared to lose their authority over the, the believers. Um, I can tell you about a short. I can, I can tell you a short story about the founding of our mosque. So our mosque is, is founded by five people, five um, people all over Germany and Switzerland, and the whole community is it's a very diverse community. So we do not um, say we are a Sunni mosque or a Shia mosque. We just want to be a mosque for everybody. So that everybody can join us. We always mostly speak in German so everybody can understand because of course I have a Turkish background. Our Imam is Egyptian. If he would talk in Arabic, I wouldn't understand anything. I would understand something, but not a lot. But when we founded the mosque, um, immediately religious authorities from all over the world uh, had things to say and not just some imam from whatever books to uh, but um, uh, the University of Cairo wrote a fatwa against our mosque and the fatwa wasn't a real fatwa to be honest it was just three lines saying this is against Islam this has to be closed done and uh, Dianet the Turkish um, how do you say Amt or let's just say Ministry for Religious Affairs, they wrote the German Bundesregierung, the government, that it should close down our mosque because this is not covered by religious uh, freedoms and we are a Fethullah Gülen community mosque. Uh, I don't know if you know Fethullah Gülen, but Fethullah Gülen is pretty conservative. Um, he is a preacher, an imam who was allied to Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and now they are enemies. And uh, this is something that always happens, um, that people point to us and say, you are Fethullah Gülen, you are PKK, you are this, you are that, just to make us um, the other. Um, what I can say is our mosque works on two main um, issues. And these are women's rights and LGBT rights. Um, in our mosque, women are allowed to wear what they like. Of course, it's a religious space, so we usually don't go there with, uh, I never went there with a tank top and shorts and uh, mini skirts or whatever, but women are allowed to work, come with or without hijab. And this is something that makes people angry. Um, and But the main issue is we are open to queer people. I myself, I am a homosexual Muslim. I am gay. And I have uh, always rejected this part of me. I didn't want to be gay because I was brought up um, against it. Uh, I had a father who was traditional. 
not very religious. So he was a Muslim, yes, but he was Turkish. And the main point of his um, conservatism, you could say, was that he was born in Kayserin, on, in the mountains of Turkey, central Anatolia. And he came here with the mindset of uh, people who lived there. And I was brought up being gay is bad. And not because, as I said, Islam, but because you can't be gay and a man. A gay person can't be a man. And this is, um, everything, this is something we can observe in our work. Um, we had a campaign for queer Muslims. Uh, it was called Love is Halal, Love is Allowed. Usually we do not work with these terms, Halal and Haram because we don't want to tell people what to do or what to not do. We want to give them the sources and then they can read them and they can work on them uh, with us, of course, but I don't like saying what you're doing is haram or it's halal. But there we said it is halal. And um, I will in a few minutes come to why we say that, but we in this campaign we had five people um, who were seen on posters. Two of them were anonymous, three of us were visible. Uh, so we had um, the Kurdish queen, who is a not the actual Kurdish queen because there's none, but a Kurdish drag queen, a Marwa, who is a lesbian, and me as a gay Muslim. And then we had a trans person and a bisexual person, not visible. And we all got lots of death threats and, and um, yeah, beleidigungen, insults, lots of insults, lots, lots of death threats, uh, in a, until the point where I couldn't go out safely because people um, saw me and they recognized me because there were fo photos of me all over the city. And um, that's why my hair now is so long, uh, because I had to kind of change my, my looks. I had very short hair on the photo and a longer beard. So I changed that and always walked around with the FFP2 mask. And it, only I had to do that. This is the point that I wanted to get to, because as a gay Muslim, this is what we saw. I got the most death threats. Not the I was not the only one who got them, but a gay Muslim is um, seen as um, trying to destroy the concept of a man. Not only me, but this is something that we saw. Um, why do we say love is halal? Um, Yes, there is the story of the prophet Lut. Um, Christians and Jews know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the city was destroyed as a punishment. Um, the Quran is not very detailed on the whole story, not as much as the Old Testament. But we interpret this passage of the Quran in a way where we say, this was a story about rejecting a prophet. It was a story about rape, about violence, and not about um, same-sex love. Something that you can definitely read out of there is um, women are not even mentioned. So lesbian love in this uh, story of the prophet of Lord is not mentioned at all, so it can't be said, yes, homosexuality is definitely haram. Um, and men are mentioned. Um, depending on how you read it, you can say, yes, it is said um, a man shouldn't be with a man. But you could also read it in a way where you could say a man shouldn't be with a man when he's married. But I'm not here to tell you about the right Islam because I am definitely, I can tell you. We live one Islam of many. So I am saying I am a Muslim, I work in a mosque, I have my own interpretation of Islam, and I can say because of what I said, homosexuality is halal. But it does not have to be halal for you. You can go to a conservative mosque and you can be heterosexual or even homosexual or trans or whatever. 
And you can say, no, for me, it is haram. This is okay for you. What I'm advocating for, what I'm fighting for is that at least people who are queer should be tolerated and should be seen as a part of our community, of the Muslim community and the society in general. I'm not here to be the caliph of Berlin. I'm here to be one Muslim of many. Um, and in... Well, why I'm advocating this is I know many people, I was one of them myself, who radicalized because of the thought that homosexuality is haram. Um, I went as far as almost going to Syria as a, as a terrorist because I couldn't live as a gay Muslim. I always read... Um, Whenever you make dua, whenever you pray to God, God will give you what you're asking for. So either he will say yes, he will say later, or he will say this, what you're asking for is not good for you. And I thought for six years, well, what, what, what's wrong? Why doesn't Allah listen to me? Why doesn't he give me heterosexuality? This was one of the main things that I was praying for. Not only me, I can tell you about my perspective with Many people behind us uh, who are not here today who lived the same thing. And then in Ramadan, which is also right now, um, the preachers always taught me um, the jinn and the devils when it's Ramadan, they are in uh, hell and they are chained up and they can't um, whisper things into your ears so that you are doing bad things. And I was looking forward to it, and then I was still gay. I'm also gay right now, just so you know. Um, and uh, things did, just didn't make sense. And in 2017, the mosque was founded. I was there for the opening, and I was there for the first event about Islam and homosexuality. And um, Imam Ludovic, who should have been here today, he made a presentation on Islam and homosexuality, and it was very scientific, not emotional at all. And um, I liked that. I thought, well, okay, before I was kind of rejecting Islam, distancing myself from it for a few months. And then I thought, yes, apparently you can be gay and you can be a Muslim. And this is also why, in all transparency, I was looking forward to this event. Um, as you have heard, the, we had an issue. Um, he didn't join us today because of me, apparently. This was kind of a surprise because whenever we message each other on Instagram or WhatsApp, uh, we always say, Asalaamu Alaikum, brother, how are you? Oh, I'm good, beloved brother, and so on. So this was a surprise to me, and honestly, I cannot tell you what exactly the issue is, but I hope that we can work things out and at least find out what the issue was. But yes, this sometimes happens. Um, in the uh, mosque, we have started a project called Anlaufstelle Islam and Diversity, so Contact Point Islam and Diversity. And we, it is funded by the, by the uh, family ministry. And this is something that we are very grateful for because getting money as a queer community, it is difficult because of course you won't get money from the traditional mosques who have all the money. Um, and we live, by off, we live off donations basically. But so this was a huge help. And the most important thing that uh, I work on right now, together with two um, new colleagues, is that uh, we have a regulars table for queer Muslims. And this is the most pressing and important issue because so many queer Muslims think, oh, I'm the only one. There's no such thing in my community. There's no such thing in Islam. Uh, I'm the only gay one or trans one or lesbian, bisexual, queer. And um, in this regular table, we just sit together and we talk about some issues we have or about our identity, about ourselves, and we talk to each other. But Islam, don't get me wrong, it is important in this um, context, but it's not the main issue because people sometimes need to be freed of always talking about Islam 
And this is just a really nice get together, you could say. And we also had our issues there. Uh, first, we had lockdown over lockdown and another lockdown. And then um, also the issue of money, because where do you meet up? Many people rejected to meet up in our mosque. So, of course, we have this beautiful mosque and it is a big room and you could always meet up there. But as um, Tommaso said before, we are also a project for ex-Muslims. And we have refugees who came from Iran, who came from Syria, Iraq, and they had their traumatizing events in their life, in their lives, um, where they were even tortured, almost killed, and they join us and they say, yes, I want to be with you, I am an ex-Muslim, but I will not come to your mosque, even if you are liberal, even if you would marry gay people, I, I will not go there. And that's uh, also why we always had to find another room. We had to find a cafe or a bar or whatever was most fitting. And yes, for queer Muslims, I can tell you it's always when you want to have certain events, it's about money many times. And thank you. Uh, so now um, we secured a funding for that which is very nice it's not huge but you at least can go to the theater you can go to the cinema museum cafe or whatever so this is great um other than that we are also doing pastoral care which is a very important thing as well pastoral care is Seelsorge. of course we're not pastors but we have um, imams and trained people, um, psychology students, psychologists who offer this care. Um, and we have hundreds of people per month uh, who are messaging us, who are, usually they want to talk via phone or Zoom uh, about their issues. And one, or one a huge issue is, and people sometimes forget that, um, that queer people as soon as the family finds out, if the family is a very traditional or conservative one, it might happen that they want to force them into a marriage, um, which is something that we always see about women. Of course, we hear about that. Women are forced into a marriage, which is very um, disgusting and we have to talk about it, but we also can't forget about the queer people who are forced into marriage because it really happens a lot. Um, and uh, suicidal people, and this is what I w was saying earlier, I don't want everybody in this room or everybody out there or in Turkey or wherever to say, uh, yes, homosexuality is great, being queer is great, this is not, you don't need to do that. What I'm only asking for is uh, tolerance. Tolerance uh, would at least not lead people to commit suicide, which happens, of course, as you know. And this is also why we go to schools to talk about um, Islam and queerness, Islam and women's rights and so on. We don't do that to convert the young students to a liberal Islam. Um, we would not dare to do that. They have their own principles, they have their own family, they can live however they want. But it already happened that we go to the school, we talk about queerness and Islam, we talk about queerness in general. And this one time we thought actually we might get um, stabbed there in the school. And the student was removed from the classroom and then the school even had a security uh, person who was th then standing in front of our door. So I really thought, wow, this is, uh, are we in the United States right now? Because you always hear about that in that country, but not here. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying whenever you talk to Muslims, they will stab you. I'm saying this is an issue and this is the, the field I am working in, of course, if you talk to a Catholic person, that Catholic person will also tell you about his own stories in Bavaria and in Berlin and whatever, and free churches, awful uh, stories. I, I've heard about them and also in Poland about uh, the Catholics. But I can only talk to you about my um, perspective as a member of the Muslim community. 
And yes, this is basically our work. I think this is, I can wrap it up uh, with that. Of course, it's also praying and fasting together and all those um, spiritual things <coughs> we are working on, but this, these are the main things. Um, what's important for me in the end to say, um, sometimes it is difficult to talk about these issues, about Islam and queerness, about Islam and women's rights, while we are surrounded by a um, society that is not Muslim, by a society where there are racism issues, of course. And uh, it is difficult because you do not want to give ammunition to the AfD, but in the same time you want to protect yourself and you want to protect your community. So um, this is also actually one really difficult uh, thing. This is also why we do not want to talk to um, this one time, I can tell you this, uh, we always have politicians who come to us and then from the, the Grünen, from SPD, whatever, the, all those democratic parties, actually democratic parties. And then this one time the AfD messaged us and they wanted us to sign a paper. And, and well, I read the paper and then it said, Islam does not belong to Germany. And he wanted us to sign it. And I thought, well, good morning, mister. But I think I am part of Germany, to be honest. Um, but yes, this is a very difficult thing. And I think I, I will yield my one minute. Uh, I think I've talked about the most pressing issues that we are working on. And maybe we can talk more in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And personally, I find the work you do absolutely commendable. And let me say something about the threats. I think the more threats you receive, the more they show not only how brave you are and what you are doing, but most of all, how much your work is needed. So I would like to know if you facing these threats, if you receive support, and if it happened to you to receive support from places, institutions, or people you didn't expect, and vice versa, if you were expecting some support mm -hmm. that instead didn't come from somewhere. Yes, so... Um I didn't expect support from my old uh, school friends, to be honest, because uh, they became my friends when I was a um, Salafi Muslim. I was really radical. I radicalized. We all radicalized together. And then a few years ago, one or two years ago, they messaged me and they said, the work you are doing, it's great. Don't let these people fool you. Don't let them threaten you. And even the most radical out of all of them, even he messaged me and said, well, back then we got uh, captured by these um, Rattenfinger, uh, rat, whatever, I don't know how to translate that. Um, so the hate preachers, don't let them um, insult you or whatever. So that was something that was really important uh, for me. And last year we had his or hang out the queer flag, the uh, pride flag out of our mosque. And it was a really big flag. And we did that together with the CSD Berlin EV pride organization. And they went to all of the religious spaces in Berlin, not all of them, of course, but many. Mm -hmm. And they were hanging flags together. And we had um, politicians there. At that time, I was in CSD Köln, but we had some politicians there and our mom. And as I said, as you also said before, we got lots of threats from all over the world. So from Egypt, from Chechnya, from Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, all over the world. And we didn't get that much solidarity there, I must say. We have a... Um, Anti-Diskriminierungsbeauftragte, and I was quite happy about what she said because she said um, 
the important thing is to make these threads, to make these, not um, concerning us, but in general, to make everything public. People have to know in order to know that there is something they have to fight for, freedom. And we messaged her and she didn't want to um, show her solidarity publicly. Mm. So that was a disappointment, honestly. But of course, we have politicians in Berlin who were... Uh, who showed their solidarity from all the democratic parties. Okay, thank you. So, thank you both. Before opening for questions, I would like to challenge you both on your respective points. I think both your presentations were extremely interesting and raised inputs for reflection, from maybe from opposite angles. So, in your case, Arash, um, I would like to bring your premise to the further conclusion. So you stated correctly then that it is not about Islam, but that Christianity, for instance, was a, uh, is a, as a religion, uh, homophobic, or that in any case it, was, it has been secularism that in Europe has brought uh, about human rights. But I would like to go even further and to say that homophobia is not even about religion. I mean, I still remember from high school studies, uh, when we study Latin literature, the role of the passive partner in Latin literature is pretty much what you describe yes, I in, your, in your studies. Yes. But even if we go uh, more recent in time, Nazis were actively prosecuting and butchering gay people. Communist regime, despite their atheism, are actively prosecuting and butchering gay people. So my question is, what makes you think that it is about religion? And I would add another element. In, one of your, in another of your papers, you actually show that a correct application, a very scrupulous application of hudud procedures actually limits the possibility for the judge to persecute yes, gay people. So, why do you think it is about religion and why shouldn't a liberal approach to religion actually be a key towards the resolution? J just a second, because I want to connect, okay, yeah, okay. I want to connect this to a, a specular question to, to Guy. Because in your case, I would say that you depict a quite a a very uh, brave, as I say, but also a rosy picture of Islam. I mean, as I, as I started my introduction, the reality on the ground is very different, both if you look at the level of people and the, the amount of homophobia that exists among Muslim communities, whether in Muslim-majority countries or in Muslim-minority countries. But these also merits the same, the equal amount of homophobia that comes from the, um, the intellectual levels, the scholars, the, the clerics. So um, I would like to quote you actually, Scott Kugel, uh, who is, for sure you know him, is one of those who actually claim, like you, that there is a compatibility between uh, Islam and homosexuality based on a different exegesis of the scriptures. But he also says... In Islam, homosexuality is regarded as an aberration, as a violation of nature, and there is consensus about it. So what makes you think, I'm not a theologian, I'm not Muslim, so I cannot say whether the, these scholars are right or you are right, but what I can say is that you are a very niche minority. So what makes you think that your interpretation is correct and even more that you can make an impact? So these are my two challenges to both of you. Maybe this time we start with you and, and then we... Um, I would definitely agree with you that this is a um, niche interpretation. Um, but I, would, I want to point out that um, just because there aren't many who believe in something, um, it has to be wrong. And... When it comes to Islam, as uh, Arraj said before, religion always changes. And it has been changing for 1,400 years. Islam has been changing that entire time. And when I go to most of the imams and the scholars who say homosexuality is haram, 
Um, they will also tell me that I, no matter if I live in, in Turkey or in Syria or in Germany or wherever, uh, nowhere in, on earth I can have slaves. But having slaves was something that was possible 1,400 years ago. It was possible 1,000 years ago and even uh, 100, 100 years ago. So there, there's something that has um, changed. And also, I, I find it interesting that so many religious authorities, they have a very strong um, position when it comes to being queer but they will never as strongly op oppose, for example, um, gambling or, or drinking alcohol or whatever. They might say it is haram, but they will not say it in this fierce way, saying this is westernizing our religion, this is destroying our religion. They will say something like, okay, yeah, you shouldn't do that, it's haram. Of course, they will say that. But um, I have my interpretation and I can base my interpretation on, as I said, my own interpretation of Quran that I've told you about. And also when we talk about Liwat, for example, so the deed of the, prophet, uh, of the people of Lord, even the concept of Liwat has been changing for 1,400 years. Um, pretty early, the scholars said Liwat is um, anal, anal intercourse. And then they said, Liwat is um, pederasty. And now many people will say, Liwat is homosexuality. Um, so uh, there has been a change in a way that I uh, disagree with. But of course, as others said, we talked before, I wouldn't say the colonizers made homosexuality haram. It was. For many people, it was uh, haram before, but yes, this is what I can uh, tell you. But I wouldn't say my my interpretation is the correct one and everybody else is wrong. Um, just then the that. second part of my question, maybe we can address it later. Mm -hmm. How can you make an impact? I mean, mm -hmm. how oh, yes. can such a niche interpretation mm -hmm. actually become widespread? But maybe we can also go back yeah, I can also to that. In the, in the, if you want to... to say yeah, okay, yeah I can just I'm say it now. Um, the impact I'm hoping for is not uh, to change all Muslims on earth. The impact I'm hoping for is helping young Muslims and also older Muslims to not radicalize themselves, to not leave Islam. They can leave Islam. I wouldn't have any issue with that. But what I saw is many queer ex-Muslims, they are missing something. You know, there is Gehane. It's a mm. queer club. And uh, it's like great Turkish Arabic uh, music, lots of queers. And when you go into the smoking room, I don't smoke, but I like to go there for the conversations. Um, many people will tell you that they are missing something. They find it very interesting to talk about a liberal mosque, a liberal Islam. And this is the impact I'm hoping for, helping these people who need it, not changing something for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, I hope I get your question right. You know, if, if I didn't, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't believe that I made it all about religion. I, I asked for something like the opposite to not to reduce this discussion on religion. Uh, but what I was perhaps, perhaps that's the reason that I made this impression. I believe, of course, that the challenges of, of authority about what is a human you know, the most challenging, you know, discourse is the religion. You know, who is deciding about, uh, about uh, happiness? Who is deciding about, you know, there is, there is the, the, this is the separation between the divine law and the nature law. In, in, you know, as I think, you know, you're, you're, you're a lawyer, you, you might know. You know this is the, the, the separation between divine law, the God's law, and, and the nature law. You know, that's the moment if that, that the, let's say, the Europeans started not to wonder about things that are not like what, what God said or wanted, you know, to, to question the compatibility of nature with law, let's say, with religion. This moment hasn't happened, let's to be frank and to be reductionalistic, you know, I, I, it's perhaps not reflected enough, but I believe that's the, that's the authority of religion. 
as defining, you know, happiness, defining the, the goals of, of, of life, and defining nature, you know, it's the moment if you start to say the nature, it has other, uh, you know, logic than, than divine logic, and it, they don't have to pa pass together, then you, you come to a moment, you know, there are contradictions, you know, there, it, there, are, there is same-sex, you know, orientation. There is, you know, there has been, there will be, there is. Uh, you know, and it's the moment that if you are in a religious discourse which say the thing that God says is the right way of nature, then it is about religion. Because, you know, they, when, when you start defining the world through the, 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 the lens of God, you know, having him as, as the center, this is this theocentric view, of course it had impact. But it, just to, 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 uh, uh, I, I, uh, to, uh, come back to, to some examples on two guys' own life or, or, to, or, or the people you have been talking about, it's not about only religion, it's about masculinity. You know, the, the problem are, you know, as you discuss also, the problem, the main problem is the passive man. The passive guys, they are breaching against understanding of masculinity. The other ones, you know, women, I'm sorry, uh, please don't, Take this, this sentence from me. Women's have, women have been really ignored in sexual history because lesbians, you know, um, or same sex among women, you know, you could urge this person to, to marry and make her be raped in this marriage. And that's what happened to lesbian women. You know, they, they got married, you know, and then perhaps they got raped in their marriages. And, and, but they weren't not challenged because of if, 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 if this, if, if an ideal, ideology, if the, if the, 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 the worldview is, is androcentric, the man is the best one, you know, this is the man who is unfocused. Therefore, not only in Islamic culture, but in any other, um, homophobic structures, the most, tar the, the, the first target is, is the effeminate gays, you know, people who are, and not manly enough, nor masculine enough, uh, and and that's that's the, the the same point, you know. And if you look at this uh, stories, what I told, they are men and gays. These men, they are the one. They, they also have same sex eh? uh, same sex activities, but the gays are the passive one. They they are. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. This, what I'm trying to say, of course, is the question of masculinity, the understanding of masculinity and and sexuality, uh, uh, gender. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much. Now let's open for questions from the audience. Uh, let's see. Yes, please. I think uh, there is a microphone coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, my name is Sean. I am not Muslim, was raised Catholic, so I think I have a very kind of good understanding of where kind of the intersection between well, masculinity, patriarchy, and um, kind of religious dogma lie on the other side. Um, my question is kind of in regards to um, many things that were said. Um, one, you had mentioned love is halal, um, also mentioned how certain um, religious communities aren't as um, gung-ho to kind of persecute or um, condemn drinking or gambling and to me, there's just always that difference um, between a homosexual act and kind of elevating it to an identity, which um, kind of shifts the whole perspective as um, challenging a worldview or challenging kind of a you know bifurcated um, religious identity as man and woman. Um, and what we see now in a lot of Christian communities, um, especially in the U.S., is um, this drive to kind of conversion therapy, where uh, homosexuality is kind of seen as, you know, an option, not a, like a choice, basically, where um, you have to kind of denounce sin as your duty as a Christian. Um, and I think my question is, how do you see that kind of um, plurality in, for the one, for one part, kind of accepting homosexuals and just um, seeing it as their duty to kind of withstand sin? Um, versus condemning homosexuals as kind of an abomination of nature. Um, 
and maybe touching on that also, um, I know in Iran, for instance, um, homosexuals for a long time, and I think up until today, are kind of encouraged to just change sexes. So, which also adds kind of a twisted um, liberalism towards trans people who, I'm not saying they have an easy life, but um, they have options that you wouldn't have expected, say, from kind of a, um, yeah, from a Western perspective. And so, um, yeah, question is kind of geared towards both of you, if you could kind of uh, enlighten us as to how these different elements kind of play into it and how the discussions are held within um, religious communities, but also within the, um, well, Iranian society or Muslim societies. Um, yes, uh, I if I understood the question right, um, I can tell you about, uh, I can tell you that there's a wide spectrum of um, how the families of um, queer Muslims or ex-Muslims might react. Um, I know some people who are fully accepted. I know some people who are rejected and they had to leave their homes. And uh, some people who were victims of violence after they came out. There's also such a thing as... Um, conversion but not as a therapy but we have a member of our regular circle who who didn't come out as gay his parents found out and then they called an imam and they did an exorcism for a few hours they chained him to the bed and they tried to get the homosexuality out this is not the typical thing to happen but it happens we don't have conversion. I've never heard of conversion camps, as I've heard there are some in the United States. But um, this is definitely um, an issue. Um, but many homosexuals, I can mostly talk about homosexuals because um, these other people I've talked to, this is my own um, experience. Many are accepted by their family, but you don't talk about it. Uh, you, sh you And you shouldn't talk about it. For example, when it comes to my own grandmother, she definitely knows that I'm gay, um, because everybody knows. And even in my family, there was lots of gossip. I am on the media when it comes to that. And whenever she sees me, she <laughs> she's coming to uh, Germany every few months. She lives in uh, Istanbul, and whenever she's here, she's like, and to guy, when do you marry? And I'm always saying, well, well, I'm I'm working later and later. And then she says, yes, yes, my son, work. And this is, um, um, and she knows that I moved together with my partner. So she will, she knows it. And this is something that I've seen in lots of uh, families of the people who attend our regular cir circle. Um, they will especially when they are, I don't know if it's a trend, I haven't studied it, but especially with Egyptian members of our circle and Turkish members, this happens a lot, um, but of course it might happen everywhere, but yes, I hope I, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, partly, yeah. Partly. Um, <laughs> in terms of religious institutions, is there kind of a um, spectrum of some condemn homosexuality outright mm -hmm. as an abomination, some just see it as sin and offer kind of a helping hand to um, queer people that come to mm -hmm. the mosque and... I think um, I can. I'm pretty sure that all of them will try to help you um, their, in their own understanding. They will try to help you to get rid of it, and they will be very open. And they will be. They are happy that you came there, and they are. Yeah, they will be have an open door um, to help you. They will not say this is an abomination. You will have. You have to die. Um, they will see it as very respectable. And I can tell you about uh, one of the most famous um, online preachers, Pierre Vogel. Um, he is a very radical person. He ra radicalized me in my youth. And back then and still today, he's always talking about this uh, gay person who is a member of his community. And he's saying, look, he was... Uh, successful, you can also be successful. He's the good one. He is trying to get rid of it, and now he's married, and now he has kids. You should do the same. So, yes, they will try to help you. I just perhaps say some, some points on what's, what's happening in Iran. What are the 
you know, approaches of the conservative uh, yeah, actors in Iran. The, 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 the um, distinction between homosexual acts and homosexuality as, as a state of being and a state of mind is discussed there too, and homosexuality as a state of mind, you know, inclination isn't frowned upon, you know, they say, it's okay, don't do it, you know, just like a Catholic, you know, approach, you know, it's in you, don't do it. But generally, uh, one of the things that I have been also studying are the science Pa the science pages, you know, there are something like like uh, pages which religious people, you know, they refer to with, 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 if they have problems, they ask about the, the contradiction between their lives. And of course, there are people who are talking about homosexuality in this and receiving some some kind of uh, um, you know help or some kind of uh, uh, you know you know assistance to get rid of it. And if you look at this, this um, you know, this, this, this um, methods that they offer, you would, you would, you, know, you would be astonished. You know, don't eat much spicy foods. <laughs> don't eat. Yeah, yes, because it is this, it, this is what I mean. It's the pre-modern understanding of sexuality. You know, because um, it, it, I'm come as a, let's 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 say two three sentences about this understanding of pre-modern of sexuality uh, understanding of sexuality in the Muslim world, it's like you have a sexuality shahwa, uh, uh, you know, you know, you have a, tr you know, you have a sexual power. It's without any kind of direction. You are an animal in this part. This is just like, like, like Aristotle's. You know, you have an, uh, a botanic existence. You have animalic, uh, animic existence. You have a humanist existence. The human existence is the one who is addressable with logic. And this is the one who is expected to control the uh, animal part. The animal part, you know, if you look at the texts of the classical jurists, when they are writing about sex with animals, they are, they are so, you know, uh, neutral about it. You know, they, they are not moralizing it. To, to be, they are just saying, what should we do with this animal? Can we eat this animal or not? You know? Like such discussions, can we can we eat this animal in this city because they had it had sex with this guy, or should we send it to another city to be eaten? Really, and and you know, 2000, let's say 19, I have been reading. I don't believe that they have changed about this 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 websites that the the the, the uh, religious institutions like like. Uh, these the schools are, are offering for religious leader. They are telling them, don't look at your handsome friends. Anyone who looks, it's really, really you laugh, I laughed a lot too, you know, it's really, I, I, it's really funny, don't eat pepper, don't, don't wear, uh, don't wear tight things, and it's a very, like, a, a very, a, a very interesting combina combination of modern, modern uh, science, you don't accept Sigmund Freud there, you know, you accept Sigmund Freud to be, you know, a very hate figure for, for, for the Islamic Muslim, you know, such traditional. No, it, the point is, uh, they says, you see, our prophet had right to, to say not to let uh, two children to sleep together on a, on a, under a blanket. You see what Freud said, you know, I prof uh, I prof you know it's something, a, a mixture of many things, but the point that I'm trying to make, it's not so psychologizing. You know, it's not in a European Western manner, I would say that has to do with Christianity, that you, you, you look to where you, you search for sin inside people. The Muslim communities or the Muslim understanding of sin is more outside people, you know? You are a neutral thing and the Satan comes, he, he, you know? And it, it, it's fun, you know? Sin is in Islamic understanding something fun, of course. You know, everyone could have fun. Uh, you know, therefore, you have not to start with it to get addicted with it. But it doesn't change the personality of, of a man who is sleeping with men. Um, so um, no conversion therapy is suggested. Usually it's said, go to a doctor and check your hormones. Let's say, check your hormones for me is humoral medicine. Just, just look if your, corpor in, uh, your, your body is balanced, yeah, yeah. like yeah. your hormones. In, you know, um, two, two, 200 years ago, they were not the hormones, but the humors. If you have enough, you know, 
uh, red by um, white, yellow bile or black bile or something. Yes. Um, yes, I hope I could say some. Good. More. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Ruth? Yeah, just uh, uh, the microphone. I just uh, realized that at the beginning I didn't even even introduce myself. So, <laughs> for those also listening online, but also some of you in the audience who might not know me, uh, I'm Ruth Koopmans, um, director of the migration and integration department here at uh, WZB. So, uh, Arash, you started by saying that um, um, you wanted to criticize the subtitle, uh, which is a question, uh, inherent oxymoron or possible harmony. Doesn't imply an answer, of course, uh, although, of course, it's, <laughs> it's quite clear that uh, the answer that we are hinting at is also the one yeah, about, about possible harmony. But, of course, the question, and I think that became very clear from both your uh, talks, the question is a very uh, appropriate one in the sense that, as you said yourself, almost every Muslim cleric will tell you that it's an inherent in ox oxymoron. And as you rightly said, this is not just uh, a Western import or something, but it's it goes back a long way in the Islamic tradition. And one might say the same thing, by, by the way, about Christianity, that it's an inherent in ox oxymoron uh, to, a, to a certain extent. Um, and of course, also in your personal experience, that question, is it an inherent oxymoron or a possible harm? That was the question that radicalized you. That's the question that tormented you. So asking this question is not strange, no, I, I would I, say. I, was, I didn't mean, I, didn't, I, I uh, tried to make this clear that I didn't criticize you for, for, for choosing this question. I, I see the necessity of this question, but uh, I still remain on this point. If we accept this question as a, that this first part, the answer should be no. Because if you are a social contrast, you know, if you consider things that human people, are, the human had made, human being have made, you know, you, 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 they are due to change. You know, it's, they are subject to sub, subject to change. You know, just, there is nothing which is, has been remained constant, and there is nothing. So that that's the point that I still say there is not an inherent core. Uh, there is nothing special about Islam that the situation is, is situation is like this now. Because if you ask the same question, you could have asked it 100 years ago about an, an Christianity. You know, you know the, the first movements against, uh, um, um, you know, the first, let's say, homosexual movements of the European world is something like, do, should we take these people to court or not? You know, the first people who are started to say no, they were the 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 uh, the, the, the medicine, they were the, the doctors, let's say, who said no, they are not, they are not sinners, they are sick. You know, let 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 them come to us. You know, um, and at this moment, this is this, this is the moment that that the, the doctors win. Let's speak Foucault. The doctors win, and and it's the gamble of the the, the priests, let's say, to say. Yeah, they are also cool. You know, you, they have to ignore a bunch of a bunch of Christianity to say we are uh, for 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 uh, a tolerance against the food towards. They have to get rid of a lot of Christianity. They have had to do it. They have done it. This John has been done. This you know, in, in the context of let's say Protestants uh, at least. You know, in Catholic churches. Being more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let, let's be loyal to itself. Uh, sorry, uh, but um, anyway, that's that's the point. What I'm not criticizing you for, for, for uh, you know, just just using a question which is every day, which has perhaps to every day be asked. But at the same time, uh, I was just trying to make this point. That every time the answer should be the question is problematic. Why? Because we have Buddhists in the 16th century in, in, in Japan, they are the most violent groups, I think. I, um, you know, that's the point, was the, the reason I criticize the question. But generally, no, the problems that you mentioned are enough. 
uh, there are enough problems to, to say at least this question should be asked and asked and asked again. No, no question at first. Perfect. We are running out of time, so I will just invite, I will just check if there is one last question. If this is not the case, then I thank, I thank you very much. I found this conversation extremely interesting, informative, and I would like to, to close with a talk to the brave people that are uh, trying to reconcile two identities without accepting to be told what their identity should be, and to the brave Iranian people that are fighting against a brutal regime, and to, to whom personally I wish uh, the fastest success as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.